I'd like to discuss software development team roles. So we're looking at a software development team, like a bunch of people, they're all coming together to um, create a software solution that um, solves a business problem. So this is a big team of people and different people in that team will have different roles. And with these roles come specific sets of responsibilities. So in this lecture, I would like to take a closer look at a typical development team and the, um, the roles within the team. And um, I'd like to give you like a quick overview of which roles there are and which responsibilities go with each individual role. So let's dive straight into it. So the, um, the process of software development, um, it differs from company to company. If you were to visit um, 10 different companies and you look specifically at how they develop software, each company will implement the process in a slightly different way. So it's all quite um, unique but there are commonalities among these different uh, companies. Um, there are certain base principles that everybody does the same. So let's zoom in on those. So uh, there will always be a need to understand the business problem. Um, there is some kind of challenge, some kind of problem uh, expressed in business terms, and that problem needs to be solved the software solution is supposed to solve this particular problem. So at a certain stage, like at the beginning of the process, someone is going to need to dig into that business problem and understand it and clarify it. So that's where this comes in. There is going to be a need to document everything in non-technical terms. Uh, we call this functional documentation. So think um, in terms of, say, the user interface. Someone is going to have to interview the business and discover what kind of user interface they need to solve their business problem. So we're talking about describing all the different, um, yeah, the, all the different interactions, all the interactivity uh, within the software that needs to be built. So we're not at the technical level yet. We're simply discussing functionality at this point. So there's going to be a person within the uh, development team who is responsible for functionality. So that would be this part. Then there will be a person who converts the functional requirements into a technical specification. And this will be a very high level uh, specification. So basically a document that describes what kind of technical solution is going to be built, but without expressing it in code anywhere. So it'll be like a diagram that basically says we'll need um, software components here and we need like a some kind of service communication here and there needs to be like a message bus or some kind of transaction pipeline here and then this is how they communicate, etc. So it's a conceptual diagram of how the eventual software uh, what it will look like. And that would be this role. Then you need someone who takes that high level architecture and converts it into actual code. So that would be the developers. So that would be this role. There will be a need to manage developers. Someone will have to take the lead and take ownership of the actual development right here. Someone will need to test the code to make sure it's up to quality standards. And someone will need to deploy the code. Deploy it to test servers or production servers so that the, uh, the business, the, um, the clients basically, can use the software and test if it's up to their uh, requirements, if, it, if the software meets their requirements. So that would be someone responsible for deploying. So these are basic roles. You'll find them in any company. Everybody who does uh, software development in a fairly large team, say 10 people or so, you will have these roles within an organization. So when you um, draw them, 
in a kind of an org chart, you get this picture. So let's go through all of these rows one by one. Um, I will give you a high-level overview of the uh, various roles, uh, so we can get into detail later on. So let's start all the way at the right here, this point. So these two people are user representatives. User representatives, it's a difficult word, user representatives are the people who are going to use the software. So these are business people, they have a pressing need that needs to be um, resolved with software. So they will be the end user. Now, often you have a large group of end users in a company, so these people nominate one person to represent them. So that's why I call them the user representative, because it's one person or two people representing a large group of end users. So these user reps are going to convey their requirements to someone who's going to combine them into a functional specification. And that would be this person here. So this is the functional analyst. The functional analyst takes the input from the user representatives. So he takes this input and gathers it and creates a functional requirements document. So this is actually a, a fairly large document. It's a complete functional specification of what needs to be built, but purely functional. So it will only express um, the uh, eventual software in terms of there needs to be a component that does this, or there needs to be some kind of black box and you put this in and this comes out. Or we want a user interface with at least three buttons and two lists with these contents. So it's all going to be very abstract. The next step is that these functional specifications will be translated into a technical specification. And that's where this person comes in. This is the solution architect. So the architect talks to the functional analyst, takes the input, which is the functional specifications, and turns it into a solution architecture. The solution architecture is a high-level uh, description of the software that needs to be built. So we're talking about a diagram. There's no code, there's no detail anywhere. It's like a 10,000 foot high uh, helicopter view of what needs to be developed. Um, so most architecture uh, specifications will basically look like combinations of patterns, design patterns linked together like Lego uh, with a description of how they communicate. So once this um, architecture document is available, we can move to the next step. Uh, the next step is the lead developer right here. So this man or woman is the leader of the development team and responsible for all implementation. So remember, the architecture specification was high level. The lead developer takes this high level document and starts coding and creates the actual implementation, the code that implements the architect, the, sorry, the code that implements the architecture. So the lead developer talks to the architect and implements the architectural specification and produces lines of code. And of course, the lead developer is the leader of a development team. So uh, there will be a number of developers right here who work for the lead developer, basically, and help the lead developer to implement uh, the architecture and write all the code. The lead developer is kind of like the, uh, the mentor, the leader and the mentor of the entire team. It's the person you would go to if you have uh, any problems or questions or um, you want to learn something new. If you put 10 developers in a room and someone has a problem um, and everybody kind of naturally goes to John for a solution, then John is the de facto lead developer of the team. So there's always a, a leader, basically. So the uh, solution architect talks to the lead developer. The lead developer uh, is responsible for the implementation and uh, so takes the uh, architecture, 
breaks it down into manageable tasks, hands the tasks over to the developers, and the developers code, and the lead developer code as well. So this is basically the entire process from an abstract business need, formulated in, in business terms, all the way down to the actual lines of code that implement the business requirements. Now, there are a few extra roles that um, support uh, these people that we've talked about so far. Um, a very important role is quality assurance, right here, QA. QA is responsible for testing. So the idea is that while the team is developing code, QA is constantly testing that code. So QA needs to know how the code is supposed to behave. So usually you can get that from the functional uh, requirements, from the functional specifications. Uh, QA is, res is responsible for creating tests that uh, objectively test if the code uh, adheres to these requirements. And then QA is responsible for continuously implementing these tests, ideally once every week, a complete test run every week. Now, usually there isn't enough manpower to uh, run tests every week. Uh, test automation is extremely useful for QA because with automation you can actually run extensive tests every week. Um, basically, the more often QA runs a test, the higher the quality of the eventual code will be. So QA is essential. It's a supportive role, but it's super important. Then we have the deployment manager right here. The deployment manager is responsible for deploying the code. Um, so uh, when an implementation has been uh, developed, uh, for example, you're using Scrum and you have sprints and you had like a two week sprint and the sprint is over and you actually have a product. You could actually deploy that product on a staging environment and then have people look at it and test it. The deployment manager is responsible for these deployment runs for basically for nightly builds for weekly automated deployments and also for moving code from staging to production um, you often see that um, this deployment role is completely independent from the uh, development team and the reason is that only the deployment manager needs to have the production passwords so the uh, development team can write code but they can't access the production servers they have no access to those servers and there's only one specific role within the company that can take the code on staging and actually move it over to production. So by putting this role into a separate person and keeping that person outside of the dev team, um, it's, it actually works as a security measure. So you often see um, separate individuals um, only responsible for deployment. Two more roles to discuss. We have the project manager right here. The project manager is responsible for the planning. So for um, the specific planning when a part of functionality will be ready, when it will be deployed. So the project manager is responsible basically for all milestones. Any milestone in the project, the exact date when a certain set of functionality will be available, um, it goes to the responsibility of the project manager. And finally, we have the trainer. Now, the trainer, sometimes, many companies don't actually have trainers because, I mean, there's so much information on the internet. Um, usually companies expect their employees to train themselves. But sometimes in really large companies, you will have this individual trainer role, a person who is responsible for coaching everybody in the IT team, making sure that their skill set is up to par um, and um, uh, train them if there are gaps in their knowledge, basically. So, one more thing to discuss. The skills required for everybody in the IT team. So, which skills are completely independent of role and uh, are required by basically everybody in the entire team? So, I've got them here on this slide. Let's go through them one by one. Um, you need to understand the business. Even if you're the developer and you get these clear-cut assignments like program this, program that, you need to at least understand what the business is trying to achieve. Um, the more business understanding you have, the bigger the chance that you produce something that is actually useful. 
to the business. So it's quite important that everybody in the organization understands what the business objective is. You need cross-domain understanding. Uh, cross-domain understanding means that if you're a developer, you know a little bit about QA. If you're a lead developer, you know a bit about deployment. If you're an architect, you know a bit about programming. So you don't kind of stay in your own house, basically, and only focus on the uh, skills and knowledge that are required for your role, but you actually know a bit of the other roles as well. Because any role that involves uh, communication and leadership, uh, you will need to be able to talk to other people. So understanding their uh, challenges and their um, say the skills that they have to meet their challenges is going to be very useful, especially if you want upward mobility in your career. So then you need to have multiple perspectives. You need to be able to see a problem from the other person's view. Um, this is extremely important for, say, the lead developer and the architect. They're both working on technical challenges. The lead developer looks at it from an implementation view. The architect looks at the same problem from a high-level view, from an architectural view. Um, it's really important that both people understand the other person's viewpoint because that makes the discussions so much easier. You need to have people skills. There's communication involved in a large IT project. So you need people skills so that you can make communication go smoothly. And finally, lifelong learning. IT is moving so fast nowadays that you're going to have to commit yourself to lifelong learning. You cannot stop learning. Like, I know C-sharp, I'm done. It doesn't work like that. In five years, there'll be a new technology that's popular. So you have to stay up to speed. If you're a developer, maybe you could get away with just focusing on one core expertise. But as soon as you uh, go up the corporate ladder and you become a lead developer or an architect, then it is so important that you know a bit of all the technologies out there. So you really have to commit yourself to lifelong learning. Okay, so that was that. In a nutshell, we looked at all the different uh, roles in an IT project. We looked at the uh, responsibilities of everybody, of all the roles within the IT project. And we looked at a couple of um, universal skills that apply to everyone in the IT project.